Despite the exorbitant prices, the posh French restaurant was filled to capacity. It was a place quite popular with persons of means who not only wanted to celebrate special occasions, but wanted to show others that they could afford to do so. Kumiko and her boyfriend Hideki played the part of well-to-do young couple well. But she was a mere flower shop employee, and he had only recently started working entry-level at an investment firm. So the occasion they were celebrating was of far greater significance than the other patrons, whose celebrations could be as insignificant as what day of the week it was. This place is so expensive, said Hideki. I hope I ordered the right thing. I've never had French food before. You worry too much, replied Kumiko. I don't know if I'll be able to eat anything. My stomach feels like it's been tied up in knots. Are you really that worried about how much the meal is going to cost? Asked a chuckling Kumiko. We don't have a lot of money now, but you're going to be president of the company someday. So why not live a little? It's not just the money that I'm worried about, replied Hideki. Kumiko stopped chuckling. There was still a smile on her face, albeit a half-hearted one. The worry on Kumiko's face was quickly replaced though with a genuine smile. We're celebrating, she said. We shouldn't be worrying. You're right, said Hideki. A waiter arrived at the couple's table and filled Hideki's glass with wine. When he offered to fill Kumiko's glass, she gave him a polite smile and waved him away. We still have to tell your father, said Hideki. My father, he'll be happy, said Kumiko. I'm sure of it. I'm his only child, that makes me special. He's not just your father, said Hideki. He's also my boss. He's been looking over my shoulder at everything I do at work. I feel like he's looking for a reason to get rid of me. He wouldn't do that, said Kumiko. I don't think he likes me very much. When we told him we were moving in together, I honestly thought he was going to attack me. I've never been so afraid in my life. The couple's meals arrived shortly thereafter and the two ate their food without saying much more to one another. A few days later, Kumiko and Hideki mustered up the courage to visit the Sashihara family home. It wasn't a place Kumiko visited much after leaving to start a life of her own. But it was a place filled with many fond memories despite how strict her father had been. Kumiko was appreciative of her pampered upbringing. She had never gone without, and to the present day, was still being taken care of in one form or another by her father. Not quite knowing how to break the news to her parents, Kumiko bluntly told them, as the family enjoyed snacks at the dining room table. The response the news received was not the one Kumiko had been hoping to receive. After all that I've done for you, said Mr. Sashihara, burning his glare into Kumiko, this is how you repay me, he then startled everyone badly by slamming his fists into the table. You're not even married. Dear, please calm down, said Kumiko's mother. How could you do this, asked Mr. Sashihara. What are people going to think of this family, of me? I've had people tell me they wanted me to run for mayor. Do you think I can do that? This is happy news, said Kumiko, her voice little more than a whisper. How can you afford to raise a child, asked Mr. Sashihara. You sell flowers for a living. I have to pay the rent on that place you're living in. He then turned his glare to Hideki. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even have a job. Do you think anyone else would hire you? I only hired you to make my daughter happy. What would you two do without me? Do you want to find out? I knew it was a mistake to let you two start living together. You're just children playing house. You don't know even what it's like to be real adults. You two need to grow up. Mr. Sashihara suddenly stopped his verbal rampage to catch his breath. His wife dutifully unscrewed a bottle of pills and handed a couple to her husband. Mr. Sashihara swiftly swallowed the pills with his water and abruptly took his leave. Your father didn't mean what he said, said Kumiko's mother. You know how much stress he's under with work, and his health hasn't been very good recently. I thought he would be happy, said Kumiko. I know how badly he wanted to have a grandchild, but not like this, replied Kumiko's mother. Try to understand where your father is coming from. He and I are from a different generation than you and Hideki. We waited until we were much older before we started thinking about starting a family, and we had to get married before that thought ever crossed our minds. I was almost 30 before I even went on my first date with a man. You kids these days, you move so fast, you never take the time to think about the consequences of your actions. We've talked about this a lot, said Hideki. Me and Kumiko are ready for this. You know we're getting married in the spring. We can move the wedding up so the baby won't be born yet. No one has to know about this. We can keep it a secret. Kumiko's mother sighed. Mr. Sashihara returned. Could you give me and these two some privacy? He asked his wife. There's something I want to talk to them about. Kumiko's wife did as her husband requested and allowed the three to speak in private. The look on Mr. Sashihara's face showed Kumiko and Hideki that his mood hadn't improved since he had left the room. 
he seemed to be just as angry, if not angrier than before. Father, said Kumiko before being interrupted. Don't say a word, said Mr. Sashihara. You two are going to sit there, and you're going to listen very carefully to every word that comes out of my mouth. Kumiko and Hideki did their best to go about their lives after the unpleasant night at the Sashihara home. But it was evident to all who knew the young couple that something was weighing heavily upon their minds. Hideki wasn't particularly close to any of his co-workers, so even though many of his colleagues noticed his morose demeanor, none of them paid him much mind. Mr. Sashihara, however, had no intentions of ignoring the young man. He would burn his vengeful glare into Hideki any time the two found themselves in the same room, forcing Hideki to quickly avert his gaze. Despite his utter lack of knowledge about certain clients, Hideki soon found himself doing the lion's share of the work when those clients made new investments. This forced many late nights away from home and away from Kumiko. Things were no better for Kumiko. Many of the flower shop's regular customers noticed the change in her. The once cheerful girl was now always so glum. The store owner, Mrs. Suzuki, was just as aware as her customers how down Kumiko had become in recent days. She would often notice Kumiko just staring off into the distance, and not nearly as talkative as her usual self. This led to many nights being offered the opportunity to go home early to get herself in a better state of mind for the next day. But time after time, Kumiko would turn down the offer. For her, the flower shop was a much-needed distraction. One night, Kumiko and Hideki were afforded the opportunity to eat dinner together. Their modest budget could only afford them no more than a couple bowls of rice and a few steamed vegetables for their nightly meal. Recently the two had refrained from saying much to each other, but Kumiko wanted desperately to break the uncomfortable silence that had so swiftly become the norm. I bumped into the landlord today, she said. He says they have to upgrade the old pipes so we'll most likely be paying more for our water starting next month. Our electric bill just went up, said Hideki. These people must think we're made of money or something. By the way, did you get a chance to talk to your boss? Did she say she would let you start working some extra hours? The flower shop isn't doing well enough for me to get any extra hours, replied Kumiko. I'm lucky to be getting the hours that I'm getting now. Mrs. Suzuki really doesn't run the shop to make money. She only does it because she likes talking to all the people who come in every day. If she wasn't already so well off, she'd have closed the place years ago. The two then went back to eating their meals in silence. Hideki would take quick peeks at Kumiko, but look away when she made even the slightest indication that she was about to look back at him. Your father called me into his office today, blurted out Hideki, much to the surprise of Kumiko, who abruptly stopped chewing her food. What did he say? asked Kumiko. She was sure that today was the day her father would finally terminate Hideki's employment, thus putting the two into a financial hole from which they would surely never be able to escape. He just wanted to know how you and I were doing, replied Hideki. Kumiko knew Hideki far too well to believe what he had just said. She could tell by his demeanor that Hideki was hiding something from her. Is that all you two talked about? asked Kumiko. Hideki lowered his head and began fiddling with his rice. That's mostly what we talked about, he replied. What else did you talk about? asked Kumiko. He really wants us to reconsider his offer, said Hideki. He thinks it's what would be best for us, we wouldn't have to worry about money, your father would take care of everything, he even said he would help us buy a house of our own, and he would push the wedding up so we could get married before Christmas. You call it an offer? asked Kumiko. This is not an offer, this is an ultimatum. If we don't do what he wants, then he'll make our lives miserable. It's what he did to me growing up. I got everything I wanted only because I did exactly what he told me to do. It was horrible. When I left, I thought those days were over. But now he has me right where he wants me, just like when I was a little girl. I really think we should accept his help, said Hideki. Are you joking? asked an exasperated Kumiko. I can't believe what I'm hearing. How can you think that? You don't understand, said Hideki. It sounds like if we don't do what he wants, I might lose my job. I don't care about your damn job, exclaimed Kumiko. You don't even like working there, you tell me that all the time. Do you fully understand what he wants from us? We need the help, said Hideki. We're not going to make it on our own. No, shouted Kumiko, who had finally reached her limit. I will never give that man what he wants, do you understand? You can lose your job, we can lose the roof over our heads, we can lose any food we have to eat, I won't do it and with that, Kumiko angrily departed to her bedroom. The next few weeks were very difficult for Kumiko and Hideki. 
They spent most of their time away from each other as best as they could in such a small apartment, and any time Hideki did dare speak to Kumiko, it was to tell her that her father was once again putting pressure on him to convince Kumiko to accept his most generous offer. This always resulted in Kumiko walking away without saying a word. The only solace Kumiko could take during this time was in her talks with Mrs. Suzuki at work. She felt she could confide in her, and receive the impartial advice that her mother would most likely not be able to offer. Mrs. Suzuki would always tell Kumiko that she was doing the right thing by not accepting her father's offer of moving back into the family home for the time being and accepting his money. It was obvious that Mr. Sashihara wanted to keep Kumiko under his thumb much in the way he had done with her during her younger years. On a day no different from any other, Kumiko found herself working the counter at the flower shop. A steady rain had begun to fall outside. As had become almost the norm Kumiko began staring blankly into the distance. It was something she did often, but suddenly she was doing it more than usual. Mrs. Suzuki broke Kumiko out of her state when she approached. The rain really is keeping the customers away today, isn't it? She said. Gives you more time to get lost in your thoughts. Sorry, replied Kumiko. I dot dot quote. Mrs. Suzuki interrupted Kumiko before she could finish. It's all right, she said. You've been dealing with a lot recently. I just don't want you under too much stress. It isn't good for the baby. A nervous smile appeared on Kumiko's face. I think things will get better soon, she said. I've been talking more with Hideki. That's good, said Mrs. Suzuki. Since there's no customers, go ahead and go home. I can close up tonight. I can stay, replied Kumiko. I don't mind. Don't you worry about it, said Mrs. Suzuki. Go home and spend some time with Hideki. Kumiko did as Mrs. Suzuki had suggested and headed home early. The rain had begun falling faster and the sun had set, making the conditions for driving less than ideal. On the drive home, Kumiko couldn't help but think of everything that was happening in her life. She thought this would have been the happiest of times, but it turned into something far worse that turned most of her relationships upside down. Unable to control her emotions any longer, Kumiko began crying. The road was already difficult to see, but with tears in her eyes, Kumiko was unable to see much of anything. Still, she continued at her current speed. In what felt like the blink of an eye, Kumiko veered off the road and slammed into a tree. Kumiko had somehow survived the crash. She had sustained a plethora of injuries, however, requiring several surgeries and a lengthy stay in the hospital. But she was alive and that was all that mattered. Some believed Kumiko surviving such a horrible accident was nothing short of a miracle. When she had recovered enough to have visitors, Kumiko rarely said a word to them. She would just stare blankly out the window and wait for her family and friends to leave her alone. Only those who knew Kumiko extremely well had known about her having been with child, and only those select people were told that the accident had caused her to lose the baby. But life had to go on, and that's exactly what happened. The next few years went by like a blur. Kumiko and Hideki were able to mend their relationship and joined in holy matrimony. Kumiko was also able to become much closer to her father. His cancer diagnosis put things into perspective, making Kumiko even further realize just how fragile life really was. During their first year of marriage, Kumiko and Hideki once again found themselves with child. It was a pregnancy that everyone was overjoyed with and was something that had no need to be kept secret. When Kumiko's delivery day came, it was celebrated with gifts and well wishes. But little did anyone know that the blessed day would nearly become an unspeakable tragedy. The delivery began like any other. Kumiko was told to breathe and push, but complications arose immediately. Blood pressure is rising, doctor, said Kumiko's attending nurse. Rising blood pressure was a normal occurrence during childbirth, so it wasn't taken with too much urgency. Blood pressure is still rising. Kumiko quickly became short of breath and she began to sweat profusely. Doctor, her blood pressure is still rising, said the nurse, whose voice now had a sense of panic in it. Ignoring what the nurse was saying, the doctor kept his focus on Kumiko, Keep pushing, he exclaimed. Heart rate is increasing too fast, exclaimed the nurse. Please Kumiko breathe, you have to calm yourself down. To the dismay of everyone in the delivery room, Kumiko let out an ear-piercing scream. Heart rate is spiking, exclaimed the nurse. Doctor, Kumiko continued to scream in horrific pain. It sounded more as if she was being tortured than giving birth. Permission to administer an epidural, said the nurse. It's too late for that, exclaimed the doctor. Kumiko, you've got to keep pushing, you're so close. Tears were streaming from Kumiko's eyes. Please, she said, her voice only barely audible. Please save my baby. I don't care what happens to me. Please save her. It happened almost immediately after Kumiko had made her plea. Her blood pressure and heart rate began to drop back down to far safer levels. 
Vitals are beginning to stabilize, said the nurse who was more than a bit surprised. Doctor, it wasn't long thereafter when the sound of a healthy baby girl's crying filled the delivery room. An exhausted Kumiko smiled as best she could in her current state. Welcome to the world, Rumi-chan. Kumiko Hideki and little Rumi, now five years old, were living an ideal life. With much assistance from Kumiko's father, the family had purchased a beautiful home in one of the city's most desirable suburbs. Hideki had climbed to one of the highest positions in the company, also with much assistance from Kumiko's father. This afforded Kumiko the opportunity to quit her job at the flower shop and devote herself full-time to her family. On one quiet evening, Kumiko and Hideki sat at the dining room table to have a conversation about their daughter. Rumi's teacher called me today, said Hideki. She told me that Rumi's still not getting along with the other kids. It's just a phase that kids go through, replied Kumiko. I was the same way when I was her age. You have to do something about this, said Hideki. Rumi's teacher told me that she's talked to you about this more than once and you're not taking it seriously. If we don't do something about this, then it could lead to bigger problems in the future. You still worry too much about things, said Kumiko. You're doing it again, said Hideki. Doing what? asked Kumiko. Acting like Rumi can do no wrong, replied Hideki. You act like she's perfect. That's because Rumi-chan is perfect, said Kumiko. She's quiet and obedient, not like all those little monsters that run around destroying everything. I want her to do those things, said Hideki. Because it's normal. That's what kids are supposed to do. Are you saying Rumi-chan isn't normal? Asked Kumiko. That's not what I said. Rumi-chan is normal, said Kumiko. There's nothing wrong with her. You would know that if you spent more time with her. I can't spend as much time with her as you do because of work, explained Hideki. Even so, she's always with you. She clings to you like she's your shadow. She won't let anyone else get close to her. There's nothing wrong with her being attached to me, insisted Kumiko. I'm her mother. That's how it's supposed to be. Is this because of... Dot dot quote, no, exclaimed Kumiko, cutting off Hideki before he could finish his thought. It was clear that Kumiko was now upset because of what her husband had tried to say. I thought I told you never to bring that up. I thought since it had been five years that maybe it would be okay to talk about, said Hideki. You think something like this goes away just because a few years have passed? It's going to be with us forever. I'm sorry, said Hideki. Maybe we should just take Rumi-chan out of that school, said Kumiko. Find her a better one with better teachers, it's the best school in the city, said Hideki. I have some errands to run in the city tomorrow, said Kumiko. I think I'll take Rumi-chan with me. It'll do her good to get away from those kids for a while. Rumi entered holding a drawing she had made. I made this for you mommy, she said, handing it to Kumiko. Let's take a look, said a smiling Kumiko. The picture was of little Rumi and her mother holding hands. I nub it, how come I'm not in the picture, asked Hideki. Rumi turned her attention to her father briefly before giving her full attention back to her mother. This is a picture of me and you at the park, said Rumi. I love the park, said Kumiko. Would you like for me to take you there tomorrow? Rumi smiled and nodded her head. I have to call the office, said Hideki before departing. While her mother marveled at the drawing, Rumi watched with disdain as her father departed. The next day Kumiko took Rumi with her to run errands in the city. It was the most ideal of days. The sun was shining brightly and the sky was a perfect shade of blue. Kumiko couldn't help but smile as she led Rumi by the hand. It was the most simple of acts but it meant so much to her. Rumi-chan, announced Kumiko. I have a question for you. What is your favorite food? Melon bread, exclaimed Rumi. Melon bread, asked Kumiko. That's my favorite too. Here's another question. What is Rumi-chan's favorite animal? Cats, replied Rumi. I likes cats too, replied Kumiko. Do you think we'll see some cats in the park today? We're going to see a million cats, exclaimed Rumi. Let's see if I can think of another question. I can answer anything, said Rumi. Okay, Rumi-chan, said Kumiko. Who is your favorite person in the whole entire world? Mommy's my favorite person, exclaimed Rumi. And Rumi-chan is my favorite person. After running her errands, Kumiko took Rumi to their favorite bakery to buy melon bread. The pair then visited the local park so they could relax and enjoy their sweet treat, as the pair sat on a bench and ate their melon bread. Kumiko decided it would be as good a time as any to talk to Rumi about her behavior at school. How are things going at school, Rumi-chan? asked Kumiko. Good, replied Rumi, her mouth full of bread. Your teacher told me that you don't like the other kids. Is that true? They're a bunch of babies, replied Rumi. Everything makes them cry. You have to try to get along with them, Rumi-chan. Don't you want to have lots of friends? I don't need friends, said Rumi. All I need is you. Kumiko wasn't sure what to think or how to respond. Her phone then began ringing, shaking her from her state. Hello, answered Kumiko. 
From the corner of her eye she found a cat walking nearby, which had clearly caught Rumi's attention. The curious girl hopped off the bench and began following. Don't wander too far, said Kumiko. Rumi followed the cat to a short distance away from the bench, it stopped briefly so that it could bathe itself. Good morning Mr. Cat, said Rumi. What are your plans for today? The cat finished bathing and departed further into a wooded area. Rumi made no hesitation and eagerly followed. So wrapped up in her conversation Kumiko hadn't noticed Rumi wander off until after she had hung up. Rumi-chan, let's head back home okay, she announced. There was no answer. Scanning the area Kumiko found nary a trace of her daughter. Rumi-chan, she called out. Rumi-chan. After again receiving no response, panic began to set it. Kumiko headed in the direction she hoped Rumi had gone. Her trek took her to the wooded area. Kumiko's heart sank when she found Rumi's melon bread lying on the ground. Rumi-chan, shouted Kumiko. Venturing further into the wooded area, Kumiko found Rumi in the distance crouching down with her back turned. Rumi-chan, shouted Kumiko, now running frantically to her. Upon reaching her daughter Kumiko wrapped her arms around Rumi. Please don't ever leave like that again. Mr. Cat won't wake up, said Rumi, who had been crouching by the cat she had been following. The cat that had been so full of life just minutes ago was now lying dead on the ground. Its neck had been broken. Seeing this, Kumiko quickly led Rumi away. That night Kumiko and Hideki had a discussion about the events of the day. Kumiko had spent most of the day concealing how distraught she was for fear that it would upset Rumi. But now that her daughter had gone up to bed, Kumiko was able to allow all of her worry to pour out. I only took my eyes off her for a few minutes, sobbed Kumiko. I didn't think she would wander off like that. It's okay, said Hideki. Rumi was never in any danger. It's a safe park. Nothing ever happens there. But something could have happened, replied Kumiko. And it would have been all my fault. I'm supposed to protect Rumi-chan. If she can't depend on me, then who can she depend on? You've been under a lot of stress lately. It's understandable that you would take this so hard, but you don't have to. It all turned out fine. It isn't stress, said Kumiko. I'm just a bad mother. Unbeknownst to the couple Rumi was sitting on the stairs and listening intently to their conversation. She was eating the melon bread her mother had purchased for her as a token of contrition for temporarily losing her. The calm demeanor in which Rumi listened made it seem as if she had no sympathy for her mother who was breaking down before her. It wasn't your fault, said Hideki. Your mind was somewhere else, how could it not be, your mother had just told you that your father's health is getting worse, and we're trying to have another baby. To be honest my mind has been all over the place the last few months as well. We should visit my father soon, said Kumiko. I think it will make him feel better to see us, that's a good idea, said Hideki. Are you still going to your doctor's appointment tomorrow? Yes, replied Kumiko, I can't afford to miss it. A sound on the stairs prompted Hideki to look in that direction. The only thing out of the ordinary was Rumi's Mr. Clown doll lying on one of the stairs. The day was just like any ordinary day. Kumiko had gotten Rumi up bright and early and whisked her off to school. Her daughter was showing no adverse effects from what had happened to her the previous day, making Kumiko the only one dwelling on the unfortunate event. Nothing out of the ordinary took place that morning at school. Rumi would occasionally take peeks at the clock on the wall. But that was quite normal for kids who could tell time, as they were quite eager for recess to begin. Between peaks at the clock, Rumi would feverishly doodle on a piece of paper. Her artwork consisted of a man wearing a long white lab coat. The ferocity with which Rumi was drawing made her seem like a little girl possessed. One perplexed boy was staring at Rumi. When Rumi noticed he was staring at her, she pulled out a pair of scissors and snipped at the air, all the while a menacing look covered her face. The now terrified boy quickly averted his gaze. With her black crayon, Rumi angrily scribbled over the man in her picture until there was nothing left of him. Recess arrived shortly thereafter, and the eager children sprinted to the playground. A few of the fortunate ones were able to claim a swing before the others could. Rumi was surprisingly fast, so she was the first to claim one. The children were well aware of how to use the equipment in a responsible manner, but those rules would have to go by the wayside today, as Rumi immediately began swinging as high as she could go. The other children noticed and were quick to point out to Rumi that what she was doing was wrong. Rumi-chan, exclaimed one of the boys. Teacher says you're not supposed to go so high, you can't tell me what to do, exclaimed Rumi. Once she had reached her peak, Rumi let go of the swing. She seemed almost weightless as she soared high above the ground. Gravity would show her no mercy however. So with a most unpleasant thud, Rumi crashed to the ground. She immediately let out a horrific series of screams, prompting the other children to run for help. Kumiko was called by Rumi's teacher after the accident. 
She got to the school as quickly as she could and took her daughter away for the rest of the day. Fortunately for Rumi, Kumiko had her doctor's appointment that day, so she would take her daughter with her to get checked for any potential injuries. Rumi was the ideal patient as Dr. Kojima cleaned and bandaged her injuries. There was no crying nor even a wince from her as the good doctor tended to Rumi. She calmly sipped from a juice box and made nary a peep. Rumi had suffered only a few minor cuts and bruises to her arms and legs, making a trip to the doctor a bit overkill. But Kumiko had insisted she take her daughter from school and have her checked out. You were very lucky your mama had an appointment to see me today, Dr. Kojima told Rumi. That way I could see the both of you at once, two birds with one stone. Rumi gave no response and merely stared at the doctor, all the while sipping from her juice box. Moving on, said a now nervous Dr. Kojima, taking a seat behind his desk. He immediately began scanning Kumiko's file. How have you been sleeping? he asked. Not very well I'm afraid, replied Kumiko. You have a lot of weight on your shoulders these days, don't you? said Dr. Kojima. I saw your father last week. I don't know how much time he has left, but it's not much. Um, I was wondering if you had something stronger to help me get to sleep, said Kumiko. A nurse entered the room and carefully placed a cup of coffee on the doctor's desk before quickly departing. Ah, uh, thank you very much, he said. Where was I? the doctor asked himself. He then took a sip of his coffee. He winced and quickly placed the coffee back on his desk. She always makes it too hot. Dr. Kojima then opened one of his desk drawers and began rummaging. A new pill just came out a few weeks. Is it stronger than what you've been giving me? asked Kumiko. Dr. Kojima retrieved a bottle of pills and gave them to Kumiko. They're quite a bit stronger, he said. So you have to make sure to take only two before going to bed. Please don't take any more than that. Just put them in a glass of water and they'll dissolve quickly. Thank you very much, said Kumiko. Um, do you have my anxiety pills? Yes, said Dr. Kojima, retrieving another bottle of pills from his desk. Please remember not to mix these two medications. The doctor then took a quick peek at Rumi. Can we discuss the rest in another room? He asked. The subject about to be discussed was far more personal than a mere sleep disorder or anxiety. Of course, said Kumiko. Rumi-chan, you wait here, okay? I'm going to talk to the doctor for a few minutes and then we can go home. Rumi smiled and nodded to her mother before she and the doctor took their leave. Dr. Kojima took Kumiko to a nearby exam room. The results are the same as last time, he told Kumiko. There's too much scar tissue on the uterus. The fact that you were able to have Rumi was nothing short of a miracle. But the problems you had during the delivery only made things worse, much, much worse. Kumiko immediately began crying. I just thought if we could have another child, then things would get better, said Kumiko. Rumi-chan is having problems with the other kids at school. If she could have a little brother or sister, then she would open up more with other kids. She only wants to be with me all the time, Dr. Kojima sighed. I think maybe we should cut back on your anxiety medication. No, please don't, said Kumiko. I need it. I'm not supposed to be prescribing these to you, said the doctor. I only do it as a favor to your father. Rumi was waiting patiently for her mother in Dr. Kojima's office. She couldn't help but look around the room at all the interesting things. But what really grabbed her attention were the pills in her mother's purse. She took the bottles and, with a little struggle, was able to get their lids off. Her attention then focused on the cup of coffee upon Dr. Kojima's desk. Kumiko and Dr. Kojima returned a few minutes later, and Rumi and her mother took their leave. The car ride home was quiet. Kumiko usually had plenty to say to her daughter, but the news she had received left her in no mood to converse. Why were you crying? asked Rumi. What do you mean? asked Kumiko. When you came back your eyes were red, replied Rumi. Did the doctor say something mean to you? It was nothing, said Kumiko. Were you talking about grandpa? Um yes, we were talking about him. He's been sick for a while. Kumiko became silent as she thought about her father's situation. She perked up quickly however as not to upset Rumi. We're going to see him soon, that will make him feel better. I can't wait to see grandpa, said Rumi. Later in the day a nurse knocked on Dr. Kojima's door. Doctor, she said after not receiving a reply. The nurse opened the door to find the doctor face down on his desk. Doctor, are you okay? She asked, carefully making her way closer. Doctor, she shook him but that did her no good. She immediately felt the doctor's wrist for a pulse and placed her ear against his chest. There were no signs of life. Somebody help. Unaware of what had happened to Dr. Kojima, Kumiko blissfully went about her life. She got Rumi up bright and early the next day and took her to school. Kumiko knelt before Rumi just outside the school. Now Rumi-chan, I want you to be a good girl, okay, she said. Rumi smiled and nodded. You make sure to be nice to the other kids and be extra nice to Miss Ito. Kumiko then handed Rumi a box wrapped neatly with a bow. 
I baked cookies for your teacher, she said. So give them to her as soon as you see her. I can do that, said a smiling Rumi. You're such a good girl, said Kumiko before hugging Rumi and departing. Upon entering the school, Rumi found a trash can and promptly threw the box of cookies into it. Later in the day, Rumi was passing the time with her favorite activity. The young girl almost seemed to be in a trance as she drew her colorful art pieces. Rumi's teacher, Miss Ito, knelt down beside her student. That's such a pretty picture, Rumi-chan, she said. Are you drawing a picture of yourself? No, replied Rumi who continued drawing. Is it one of your friends here at school? I don't have any friends, replied Rumi. Like before, Rumi kept her focus squarely on her drawing. You can try to make friends, said Miss Ito. There are lots of nice boys and girls here. You can ask to play with them instead of always sitting alone and drawing. Or maybe you could draw with some of the others. I know Shota likes to draw. I don't like Shota. How about Minami? I think you two would be good friends. I don't like Minami. Why don't you like them? Asked Miss Ito. What makes them think they're so special? Asked Rumi, who seemed not to be talking to Miss Ito but to herself. I'm just as good as they are. Of course you're just as good as them, said Miss Ito. Do you ever feel like you're not good enough? Rather than respond, Rumi placed her latest work of art in front of her face. Look, I finished my picture, it's very nice, said Miss Ito. But Rumi-chan, before Miss Ito could continue asking questions that Rumi was in no real mood to answer, Rumi cut her off. This is Takayo, she said. Oh, I recognize her, said Miss Ito. You've drawn your friend before, haven't you? Rumi lowered the picture and became quite solemn. She's not my friend, she said. She's no one's friend, no one likes her. When Kumiko came to pick up Rumi after school, Miss Ito pulled her aside to talk with her. Rumi-chan still isn't making friends, she said. I've been talking to her, but nothing is working. She's just so cold around the other children. My husband and I set up play dates with our friend's children, said Kumiko, but she never seems interested at all. I think she might be a little shy around other children. All she does is sit alone and draw, said Miss Ito. Her pictures are almost always of the same little girl. For the life of me, I can't remember what her name was. I think she wants a little baby sister, said Kumiko. Me and my husband have been trying to get pregnant, but we've been having a difficult time, with her concerns failing to alarm a mother who clearly saw her daughter through rose-colored glasses, Miss Ito dropped yet another piece of troubling information upon her. I found the box of cookies you made for me in the trash, she said. I think Rumi-chan just got a little confused, insisted Kumiko. She's never given anyone a gift before. I'm sure she knew you would know where to find it, another parent waved Miss Ito over, giving her a much-needed reason to excuse herself. The family sat down to have dinner that night. Long gone were the days where Kumiko and Hideki were forced to sustain themselves with meager meals of rice and vegetables. Kumiko's food budget would surely have made her former self more than a bit envious. So Rumi-chan, how was school? asked Hideki. Good, replied Rumi. Whenever her father asked her any sort of question, Rumi's answer was usually only a word or two, making her recent answer nothing out of the ordinary. Did anything exciting happen? asked Kumiko. Akio spilled his milk all over himself at lunch, said Rumi. He started crying, it was funny. Seeing bad things happen to people shouldn't make you happy, said Hideki. Rumi gave her father no response, she merely went about eating her dinner. Kumiko tucked Rumi in later that night, she told her to get good sleep, because the next day they would be leaving early to see her grandfather. The house was eerily dark that night, as black clouds had blocked out the moon, and nary a sound was heard within the smother of shadows, Kumiko had fallen fast asleep with the aid of sleeping pills. In far too deep a sleep, Kumiko was unable to see that Rumi was now standing at her bedside. Her daughter took the utmost of care to not wake her mother as she climbed onto the bed and on top of Kumiko. I love you the most, whispered Rumi. She then proceeded to wrap her hands around her mother's throat and squeeze the life out of her. Kumiko awoke, gasping desperately for breath. She sat up and immediately placed her hand on her throat. With a heart nearly pounding out of the chest, Kumiko began scanning the room but found nothing out of the ordinary. Hideki had been woken by all of the noise and turned on a lamp. What's wrong? he asked. Thinking what she had experienced was nothing more than a nightmare, Kumiko began calming down. It was nothing, she said. Just a bad dream. Looking to her bedside, Kumiko found Rumi's Mr. Clown doll lying on the floor. The next morning the family headed out to visit Kumiko's father. Cancer had left him with very little time so any chance the family had to spend with him was to be cherished. On the drive Kumiko leaned into the back seat and handed Rumi her Mr. Clown doll. Did you lose this? she asked. Rumi happily took the clown from Kumiko. There you are Mr. Clown, she said happily. You're very naughty for sneaking out, you won't get any treats. Why was it by mommy and daddy's bed? asked Kumiko. Rumi gave no reply and began playing with her doll. 
You shouldn't leave your toys lying around, said Hideki. I'm always finding them all over the house. Once again, Rumi gave no reply. Kumiko gave up on getting a reply from Rumi. Instead, she began gazing out the window. I hope we don't crash, Mr. Clown, said Rumi. Bad things can happen on these roads. Rumi then changed her voice so that it was Mr. Clown who was speaking. Then it's a good thing your mommy isn't the one driving. Hearing this captured Kumiko's full attention. Rumi-chan, what did you just say? She asked. Rumi gave no reply and continued playing with her doll. What did she say? Kumiko asked Hideki. I don't know, replied Hideki. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I'm trying to remember what road to take. Do I take this next left or do I keep going straight? Kumiko leaned as far toward the back seat as her seatbelt would allow her. What did you say? She asked. This time there was a hint of anger in her voice. I didn't say anything, said Rumi. Did you say something, Mr. Clown? Rumi then changed her voice for Mr. Clown. I didn't say anything either. Kumiko, am I going the right way? Asked Hideki. You should already know how to get there, exclaimed Kumiko. The family arrived at the Sashihara home a short time later. The yelling had ensured that the rest of the trip would be made in complete silence. Kumiko Hideki and Kumiko's mother sat at the dining table to discuss plans. Rumi was in the next room playing with her Mr. Clown doll. She was told not to enter the room so she wouldn't have to hear such grown-up talk. Have you started making arrangements for the funeral? Hideki asked Kumiko's mother. My father is still alive, said Kumiko. We shouldn't focus on that right now. It's all right, said Kumiko's mother. There's really no point in not talking about this, it really is inevitable at this point. Kumiko's mother then presented her daughter and son-in-law with a stack of papers. Our lawyers wrote these documents for you and Hideki, she said. The trio was so consumed with the paperwork that they failed to notice Rumi had slipped away from the next room and was now exploring the house. It wasn't before long when Rumi found her grandfather's room. She cautiously opened the door and entered, quietly shutting the door behind her. The lights were turned off and the curtains were closed, making it somewhat difficult to see. Lying in bed was her grandfather. He was now painfully thin and all the color had been drained from him. The once strong man was a mere shell of his former self. Hello grandfather, said Rumi. Mr. Sashihara could barely muster the strength to turn his head as only a faint sound escaped through his colorless lips. Grandfather doesn't look so good, Rumi said to Mr. Clown. She then changed her voice for her doll. I think grandfather wants to die, Rumi nodded in agreement. Rumi tossed Mr. Clown aside and immediately retrieved a spare pillow. Let's see how much grandfather likes being dead, said Rumi. It took quite some time, but eventually Kumiko and Hideki had finished reading through all of the papers that had been placed before them. Can we see father now? asked Kumiko. Of course, replied Kumiko's mother. The three made their way to Kumiko's father's room. The first to enter was Kumiko. Father, she said, cautiously making her way closer to his bed. There were no signs of life whatsoever coming from Mr. Sashihara. He might be sleeping, said Hideki. Father, said Kumiko, gently nudging him. Father? Father? Kumiko's voice was frantic enough to startle the others. Dear, said Kumiko's mother, rushing to his bedside. She too began trying to wake him, but she was being far less than gentle with him than Kumiko. From the corner of her eye Kumiko noticed Rumi watching the scene unfold. She was at the far end of the room holding her Mr. Clown doll and had the most blank of expressions on her face. The family went home a few hours later. There was nothing but silence between the three for the rest of the day. With what had happened, it came as no surprise that no one was in any kind of mood to converse. After being tucked in, Rumi began talking to her Mr. Clown doll. It's too bad what happened to your grandfather, said Mr. Clown in Rumi's disguised voice. Rumi nodded. Maybe if he had been a nicer person then that wouldn't have happened, said Mr. Clown. Nice things happen to nice people, said Rumi. Grandfather was not a nice person, said Mr. Clown. He was a bad person, Rumi again nodded. And you know what happens to bad people, said Mr. Clown. Bad things happen to them, said Rumi. Kumiko had made the choice to stay with her mother for a couple of days to help her cope with the loss of her husband. This meant that Hideki would be on his own with little Rumi. Hideki and Rumi didn't interact much over the few days Kumiko was gone. But even before this sudden situation arose, Hideki and Rumi spent very little time together. Rumi liked to spend most of her time with her mother. And whenever Hideki brought that up, Kumiko would tell him it was normal at that age for children to be more attached to their mother, and Rumi would eventually grow closer to him. The only real time Hideki and Rumi spent together while Kumiko was away was during dinner. Hideki would try his best to have a conversation with his daughter, but she always seemed so distant and unwilling to interact with him. How's the food? asked Hideki. He had made a simple meal of rice and vegetables, the only meal he had any experience making. 
It's the same thing we ate yesterday, replied Rumi, whose focus was on her food rather than her father. I'm not as creative in the kitchen as your mother is, Hideki said sheepishly. How about tomorrow we go out to eat? When is mommy coming home? asked Rumi. In a few days, said Hideki. Since grandpa died she has to help grandma for a while. I don't like when she's not here, said Rumi. You've still got me, said Hideki. Rumi gave her father no reply and continued eating. Sitting beside Rumi was her Mr. Clown doll. You really like that toy don't you? asked Hideki. I bet you didn't know that it was the first gift your mother ever bought for you. Mommy didn't buy Mr. Clown for me, said Rumi before filling her mouth with a large portion of rice. Of course she did, insisted Hideki. Who else would she have bought it for? Rumi didn't respond. Rumi-chan, said Hideki, again receiving no response. You've got to stop ignoring people when they're talking to you. Rumi continued to ignore her father and began playing with Mr. Clown. The usually docile Hideki had finally had enough. He caught his daughter completely by surprise and snatched Mr. Clown away from her. Your mother might let you get away with this kind of behavior, but I'm not going to let you, exclaimed Hideki. Give Mr. Clown back, demanded Rumi. I'll give you your toy back when you start listening to me, said Hideki. No, exclaimed Rumi. I'm warning you, Rumi-chan, said Hideki. If you don't put a stop to this behavior, dot dot quote, haven't you hurt me enough, asked Rumi. What do you mean, asked Hideki, his anger suddenly calmed. What are you talking about, you're not nice, said Rumi, her demeanor now very dark and very unsettling. She then ran off to her room. After dinner Hideki took to the living room to unwind and watch television. He had a can of beer in his hand and a few empties on a nearby table. The alcohol had quickly made him drowsy and far too oblivious to the world around him. Rumi was watching Hideki intently from the stairs, there was no expression on her face, she merely stood there and stared at him. In her hand was a large kitchen knife. Kumiko was washing the dishes at her parents' house when her mother entered the kitchen. Kumiko, said her mother. I've got to call the lawyer but I can't seem to find his number anywhere. Do you have it? Yes I have it saved in my phone, said Kumiko. She checked her pockets but came up empty. It quickly dawned on Kumiko where she had left her phone. I left my phone at home. I've been using your landline while I've been here so I hadn't even noticed that I didn't have it. It's all right dear, said Kumiko's mother. With everything that's been happening, it's understandable. I'll call Hideki, said Kumiko. I'm sure he'll be able to find it for me. Then he and Rumi-chan can come drop it off. It will be nice to see them, said Kumiko's mother. Kumiko used the house phone to call Hideki. His cell phone rang several times but he never answered. He must not have his cell phone with him, said Kumiko. I'm going to try calling the house phone. Again nobody answered. I suppose it can wait until morning, said Kumiko's mother. No, I can go get my phone, said Kumiko. If I go now, I can be back before bedtime. There was nothing out of the ordinary about the drive home. But what was out of the ordinary was that someone had left the front door unlocked. Nothing could have prepared Kumiko for what she was about to find. Upon entering, she found Hideki's lifeless body lying on the living room floor covered in blood. Kumiko let out a scream so loud that her neighbors heard it and called the police. The police arrived and immediately began scouring the house for evidence. Kumiko was asked a plethora of questions for which she had no answers, and Rumi was questioned, but all she had to tell detectives was that she had been asleep for hours. Hideki had been killed by a single slash to the throat. Detectives determined that with so many empty beer cans in the room that Hideki must have been so inebriated that he had made himself the easiest of targets for the unknown attacker. Once the interviews were over, Kumiko took Rumi to her parents' house. Rumi fell asleep quickly in one of the spare bedrooms as her mother sat nearby and watched her with teary eyes. The girl looked almost angelic as she slumbered peacefully. What happened? whispered Kumiko as she ever so gently ran her fingers through Rumi's hair. Kumiko's mother entered. Kumiko you should get some sleep, she said. I've prepared your bed. I'll be there soon, said Kumiko. After her mother left, Kumiko leaned in and kissed Rumi's forehead. Mommy loves you very much, she whispered. I won't ever let anyone hurt you. After Kumiko left Rumi opened her eyes, her expression was one of pure anger. Over a week had passed and Kumiko had yet to return to normal life. She spent most of her time in the same bed she had slept in as a child. It was familiar to her and brought her a small sense of peace during such a tumultuous time. Kumiko's mother, who had been in desperate need of a helping hand only days ago, was now acting as the primary caretaker for both Kumiko and Rumi. Unlike with most others, Mrs. Sashihara was not given the cold shoulder by Rumi. The two actually got along quite well. How was your day, Rumi-chan? asked Kumiko's mother as she and her granddaughter ate dinner. It was good, replied Rumi. We painted pictures with real paint today. Teacher said she liked mine the most, that's so nice, said Kumiko's mother. 
Can I show it to mommy? asked Rumi. Your mommy needs to rest, she's been through so much. When she's ready, then we can see her. I've been through a lot too, said Rumi, her mouth now stuffed with bread. Even more than mommy. Rumi Chan, said Kumiko's mother. You shouldn't compare your problems to your mommy's. Unaffected by what her grandmother had just said, Rumi went back to eating her dinner. The next day Kumiko's mother took Rumi to school, then headed to the city to meet with the family lawyer, leaving Kumiko on her own. Kumiko had been able to cope as best she could by filling herself with prescription pills, but those pills were quickly running out. Where did you put that number? Kumiko asked herself as she searched her purse. When her search came up empty she threw her purse to the floor. With nary a moment's hesitation, Kumiko retrieved her car keys and departed the Sashihara house. Being in such desperate need for something that could calm her frazzled nerves, Kumiko arrived at Dr. Kojima's office in no time at all. Kumiko, said the nurse working the front desk. She looked and sounded quite surprised to see the familiar face. What are you doing here? I'm sorry I didn't call first, said Kumiko. But I need to see the doctor, it's urgent. Didn't you hear? asked the nurse. Dr. Kojima is gone. Where did he go? asked Kumiko. Could you give me his new address? I really need to see him. No, Kumiko. Dr. Kojima is dead. Kumiko's heart sank. What? We're not sure what happened to him, said the nurse. About a week ago I found him slumped over his desk not breathing. They haven't released the cause of death yet. Without saying another word, Kumiko departed. With no destination in mind, Kumiko headed for the park where she and Rumi liked to spend much of their free time. She took a seat on the bench the two would sit on to enjoy their melon bread, and tried to allow the peace and quiet of the park calm her. But the only thing the quiet did was let the horrible things that were happening in her life consume Kumiko. Unable to keep her composure any longer, Kumiko began to sob uncontrollably. Kumiko returned home after her trip to the park. I'm home, she called out. Mother are you here? Rumi Chan, the house was empty and eerily quiet. With no one to stop her, Kumiko began rummaging through the house for whatever she could find to sedate her anxiety. She was hoping her mother had something to help her calm down, but all she found were medications for common elderly ailments. Kumiko searched the kitchen cabinets, but all she found was her bottle of sleeping pills. I don't want to sleep, she said, throwing the bottle into the trash can. All I do is think about you when I close my eyes. After Kumiko poured herself a glass of water, the phone began to ring. Though she was in, Ah Kumiko, it's me Miss Ito, said the voice on the other end. Oh Miss Ito, hello, replied Kumiko. I was just calling to see how you were doing. I ask Rumi all the time about you but she never wants to talk about it. I'm doing okay, said Kumiko, though the shakiness of her voice proved otherwise. Rumi seems to be handling everything very well, said Miss Ito. I've never seen a child act so normal after. Dot dot quote, I tried to get Rumi-chan to stay home, said Kumiko. But she said she wanted to go to school. She's a very strong girl. All the teachers wanted me to tell you that they hope to see you again soon, said Miss Ito. Tell them that I appreciate them thinking of me, said Kumiko. I feel like I'm almost ready to get back to a normal life. That's good to hear, said Miss Ito. I'll make sure to tell all the other teachers how you're doing, thank you, said Kumiko. Oh, before I let you go, said Miss Ito. I finally remembered the name of the little girl that Rumi is always drawing. I know it isn't important, but not knowing her name has been bothering me for so long. Oh, said Kumiko. A disinterested Kumiko proceeded to take a large drink of water as she waited for Miss Ito to tell her what the girl's name was. Yes, her name is Takayo, said Miss Ito. The glass slipped out of Kumiko's hand and crashed to the floor where it shattered into hundreds of pieces. Hello Kumiko, are you alright? asked Miss Ito. I, I'm fine, replied Kumiko. I'm sorry but I have to go now. After hanging up on Miss Ito, Kumiko began cleaning up all the broken glass. Her whole body was shaking terribly as she did so. Just as Kumiko was about to dump the glass into the trash can, she noticed something partially hidden within the waste. She carefully sifted through various discarded items and discovered Rumi's Mr. Clown doll. His arms, legs and head had all been cut off, leaving behind only his torso. The front door opening startled Kumiko and prompted her to quickly shove the dismembered doll back into the trash can. We're home, said Kumiko's mother. We ate ice cream, said Rumi. Kumiko exited the kitchen and greeted the two. Welcome home, she said. Kumiko couldn't help but feel anxious as she looked at the smile on her daughter's face that she feared was hiding a most horrible secret. Is this the knife you used when you killed your father? asked a now crazed Kumiko. Or maybe you used something else, maybe a pair of scissors or gardening shears, those would definitely do the trick, wouldn't they? Rumi began crying, prompting Kumiko to start laughing. Save your tears, she said. I know they're fake, just like everything else about you. Mommy, sobbed Rumi. 
Tell me, demanded Kumiko, again waving her knife in Rumi's face. How did you know about Takeo? No one's ever told you about her. She was a secret. The only ones who knew about her are dead now. Dead because of you. Let me go, screamed Rumi. You're not going to tell me, asked Kumiko. That's fine. You don't have to. You can take your secret to the grave. Kumiko left the living room temporarily. When she returned she had with her a canister. She immediately popped the top off and began pouring gasoline around the room. What are you doing? asked Rumi. You know what I'm doing, said Kumiko. I'm going to send you to hell to be with the others. That's where we're all going, isn't it? Because of what we did? Kumiko then reached into her pocket and pulled out a book of matches and lit a nearby candle. Make sure to say hello to them for me. Don't kill me again, screamed Rumi. What did you say? asked Kumiko. Rumi's head was lowered and she was visibly shaking. What did you say? Kumiko demanded to know. It wasn't enough to kill me once, asked Rumi. Now you want to do it again? What do you mean? asked Kumiko, a noticeable quiver in her voice. What are you talking about? You know what I mean, said Rumi, raising her head. It was rare for Kumiko to see Rumi angry, but she had never before seen this near evil look upon her daughter's face. Rumi-chan, said Kumiko. Stop calling me that, exclaimed Rumi. That's not my name, of course it is. What else would it be? Kumiko suddenly trailed off as a startling idea occurred to her. Takeo, Rumi gave no reply. All she did was stare back angrily. Kumiko began shaking her head. You're not Takeo, she said, tears forming in her eyes. I've always been Takeo. There used to be a Rumi, but she didn't make it out, so I took her body. Kumiko knelt before her daughter and touched her face. This is a dream, it has to be, she said before bursting into tears. Why are you crying? asked Takeo. Because I'm happy, replied Kumiko. I have you back. I finally have you back. That's all I've ever wanted. You never wanted me, exclaimed Takeo. If you did, then you never would have thrown me away. I didn't throw you away, said Kumiko. Yes you did, said Takeo. All of you did. That's why you had to be punished, Takeo proceeded to tell Kumiko that she had been privy to the events that had led to her untimely demise. Takeo remembered every word her grandfather had said on the day Kumiko and Hideki announced that they were expecting. He demanded Kumiko terminate the pregnancy in exchange for not only a large sum of money, but a promotion for Hideki. Failure to comply would have resulted in being cut off from the Sashihara family, including the family money. Takeo then revealed to her mother that she had been a witness to how persistent Hideki had been in trying to persuade Kumiko to accept the offer. He assured her that they would have another child someday, and the money they would be receiving would go far in securing a future for them. Dr. Kojima, though not experienced in such things, was more than a willing accomplice. He was close to the Sashihara family, and always did as Kumiko's father wanted. Whether it be ending an unwanted life or filling Kumiko with dangerous medications, Dr. Kojima was up to the task. You crashed into a tree to make people think that's how I died, said Takeo. But that's not the only reason you did it, is it? Kumiko was unable to speak through her sobbing. You tried to end your life that night, said Takeo. I'm glad you didn't. If you had then I would never get to punish you. I already tried to once. I bet you didn't know. What? gasped Kumiko. The day I was born, said Takeo. I was going to make you the first one I punished, but something stopped me. Maybe when you pretended to have a heart and begged the doctors to save me. But that didn't change anything. Unbeknownst to Kumiko, Takeo was slowly freeing her hands from the makeshift restraints. Takeo, I would give my life to protect you, said Kumiko. If I could go back and change things I would. But you can't, exclaimed Takeo. You're the most precious person in the world to me, sobbed Kumiko. If everyone disappeared tomorrow and it was just you and me, I would be happy. You're all I need. Do you know how it made me feel every day to see those kids at school? Asked Takeo. How come they didn't have to die like I did? What makes them so special? Tears filled Takeo's eyes. Why didn't you want me? Takeo-chan said Kumiko. Since that day you're all I've ever thought about. Day and night I'm consumed by thoughts of you. I've been filling myself with pills for years hoping it would make the pain go away. But nothing ever worked. Whenever I held you, I always wished you were Takeo. I just wanted someone to love me, said Takeo. Kumiko embraced her daughter just as Takeo had freed herself. Takeo-chan, I love you more than you could ever imagine, she said. I won't ever let you go again. I promise, though her hands were free, Takeo chose not to take vengeance as she had so badly been craving. Instead she wrapped her arms around her mother as tears streamed down her face. Kumiko bumped the table that held the candle she had lit. It fell to the floor and into the gasoline, instantly engulfing the room in a hellish inferno. Mommy! sobbed Takeo, embracing her mother tightly. You and me Takeo-chan, sobbed Kumiko. We'll be together forever. 
nothing will ever pull us apart. The pair was oblivious to the fact that the cabin was now ablaze all around them. They were so consumed with one another that even impending death couldn't separate them. Before long, the flames had consumed the pair. Kumiko's mother's hunch was correct. She had informed police that her daughter had most likely taken her granddaughter to the family cabin. She urged them to waste no time, as Kumiko could be quite unstable without her medication. Officers arrived too late, however, as they were presented with a cabin already mostly burned to the ground. Firefighters were able to extinguish the fire before it had a chance to spread and create even more misery. All investigators could do now was search the cabin's remains. The rising sun would do its part to aid in the search. Part of the roof was moved away revealing a most heartbreaking discovery. Kumiko and Takeo's bodies were found underneath. They had been left completely charred black. But what was even more tragic was the fact that the two were still holding on to one another. It's them, said one of the detectives. They must have become trapped. Being burned alive, there's no worse way to die. I'm sure she did everything she could to protect her child, said another detective. These two must have really loved each other. Even in death, they can't be separated, the first detective. Kumiko had a big surprise for Rumi. After school, she loaded her into the car and took her on an unexpected trip. Had Rumi been more perceptive, she would have realized that her mother hadn't packed anything for the two. It was going to be just Kumiko and Rumi all alone in the family's cabin. Coming from money afforded the family the luxuries that others could never have. How come Granny didn't come with us? asked Rumi. The young girl had been placed safely in the back seat and was drinking from what her mother had said was a special drink just for her, which was why Kumiko adamantly refused when Rumi tried to share it with her. Because this is a trip for just you and me, replied Kumiko. You like your granny, don't you? Rumi nodded. Granny's nice, she said. She is nice, said Kumiko. Rumi-chan, be honest with me. You can say whatever you want, I promise not to get mad at you. But did you think your grandpa was nice? Grandpa wasn't very nice, said Rumi. Father wasn't the easiest person to get along with, said Kumiko. How about Dr. Kojima? Do you like him? He's not nice either, replied Rumi. What did he do that wasn't nice? asked Kumiko. Doctors are supposed to help people, said Rumi. They're not supposed to hurt them. Kumiko was extremely hesitant to ask her next question, but she had to know how Rumi felt about Hideki. Rumi-chan, she said. There was no answer. Kumiko looked in the rearview mirror and found her daughter fast asleep. Unbeknownst to Rumi, the drink her mother had given her had been loaded with sleeping pills. At the Sashihara residence, Kumiko's mother was tidying up her daughter's bedroom. There were articles of clothing on the floor as well as countless tissues, no doubt having been used to wipe away countless tears. As Kumiko's mother cleared the floor she found an empty bottle of pills. It was no secret that Kumiko had been taking medication for her anxiety. She had been taking them for years, so seeing an empty bottle of pills brought up no red flags. But once Kumiko's mother checked under the bed, it became clear that there was a far larger problem at hand than just a messy room. There was a number of empty pill bottles hiding in the shadows. Kumiko's cell phone rang as she sped down the mountain road. Hello, she answered. Kumiko, are you all right? asked her mother. Of course I'm all right, replied Kumiko. Why wouldn't I be? It's just that I... That dot quote Kumiko's mother stopped herself before she could bring up the subject of her daughter's overuse of pills. Is Rumi with you? Yes, we're going on a trip, said Kumiko. May I speak with her? Not right now, she's asleep, explained Kumiko. Where are you going? Being so deep in the woods, the connection cut out. Hello, said Kumiko. With her mother no longer on the other end, Kumiko put her phone away. We're almost there, Rumi-chan, she said with a smile. Just a little longer. The sun had already set by the time Kumiko and Rumi arrived at the cabin. Ever so carefully, Kumiko carried Rumi inside. It was hours later when Rumi finally woke. You're finally awake, said Kumiko. I was afraid you were going to sleep forever. Rumi was sitting on a chair with her arms tied behind her back with an old shirt. Mommy, she said groggily. You can drop the act, said Kumiko. I know you're not who you pretend to be. You may have everyone fooled, but not me. Mommy is weird, said Rumi, trying to wriggle free. I don't like this game. Kumiko retrieved a large knife from a nearby table. Am I really weird? She asked, waving the knife in front of Rumi's face. Rumi's eyes widened at the sight. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below.